it's a pleasure to be speaking once more to the, the TAFAC conference. This time it's about a tremendous new find of a Pictish stone from Perth. I'll do so under the following headings. Uh, description, discovery, landscape context, and the iconographic and ritual context. So, the description. Geolo geologically, the stone has been identified by uh, Nigel Ruckley, who's in the audience, thank you Nigel, as a large oblong glacial erratic of metasandstone or samite from the southern highland group of the Dalrydian. It measures almost two meters high by 70 centimeters wide by 45 centimeters thick. It weighs approximately one ton. It has one tapered facet at the base of the slab on the carved face, face A, which is the one you're looking at now. The sides are irregular, though faces A and D are somewhat flatter than the rest. There are evident areas of marked stippling on some of the flatter areas, indicating dressing of the stone, but the stone does not appear to have been fully dressed. Its overall appearance is suggestive of a standing stone of some antiquity, to which the carving was later added. The following description arises out of two informal workshops held around the stone to introduce it to scholarship, as it were, and I'm grateful to the colleagues who participated in this, John Borland, Anik Bussett, Catherine Forsyth, Jane Geddes, Isabel and George Henderson, David Henry, Adrian Maldonado, Gordon Noble, Nigel Rockley, Cynthia Thickpenny, and Victoria Whitworth. Occupying most, most of face A is an incised human figure, approximately 102 centimetres in height, depicted moving right to left, with a walking gait that appears to exaggerate the posterior. The incision is cut with a single stroke of fairly uniform width and depth. Where this varies, it appears to be due to the wear of the stone. Discussion with the various colleagues already named produced a consensus that the figure should be read as naked. The feet also appear to be bare, but a faint ankle height line across the left leg and a cutaway at the same height on the right leg suggest the figure was to be understood as wearing footwear. The question of clothing is a tricky one. Nudity does not seem to be a fixed attribute of the ritual walker group, which we'll see, uh, and in sculptural terms, the presence of clothing could be indicated by a line or two here and there and then completed uh, by the application of colour, for example. The walker's right arm extends outward at a downward sloping 45 degree angle and grasps an object. The object is indicated with a single slender line incision and has a length of 77 centimetres running parallel to the head down to the knees. There's some recent scarring damage from the stone's mechanical removal, which you can see here, <coughs> and the upper end of this object, but it does not obscure its termination in a pointed head. This, and it's very clear, drawn up, but at the opposite terminal, define the object as a sphere. The left hand is much nearer to the body, and the figures are again shown in a gripping pose. Above this closed fist, is the worn suggestion of the top of another object, presumably a weapon such as a sword or a club. It appears to extend in the opposite direction behind the right leg. The head is the most worn area of the figure and its lines and features are obscured by the worn and eroded surface of the stone. Nevertheless, a clear impression of a face with a possibly extended snout above a clearly delineated chin is evident. A line appears to delineate a pushed back hairstyle leaving an exposed forehead and upper scalp. In workshop discussion, a hairstyle rather than a halibut was the preferred interpretation. Okay, so moving on to the discovery. This was made in the autumn of last year in the context of landscaping works for one phase of the ongoing A85, A9 junction roadworks in Perth. The discovery took place on the 28th of September and was made by contractors Bryce Prentice and Alex Campbell, who you can see here. Realising that the boulder was not simply a boulder, work was stopped and the stone lifted and taken to the works compound. Here we can see the context of the site from the air and plotted onto a map. You can see the scale of the construction works which had taken place 
before the stone was discovered. This was to create a new road down to a new housing estate of Bertha Park, paving the way for another road to follow to cross the new bridge to be placed just north of Schoon. And uh, you can see uh, uh, McLeod Football Stadium here. Uh, this is the crematorium uh, and uh, the fine was, was in here. And you can see that replicated on the aerial images. Here we can see the context of the site. Uh, <coughs> sorry, here we can see the road in progress swimming in between the Clifford Park uh, and uh, the stadium and the Perth Crematorium. Uh, and we might note in passing uh, that that divides a powerful contemporary ritual landscape. Uh, <coughs> uh, below we can see the road as it currently is, recently finished. Besides its iconography, which we'll look at shortly, the other chief excitement of, uh, of, of Tullock is the potential it offers for extending our understanding of the early medieval landscapes of power in the Perth area. The fire spot is on the flank, flank of a post-glacial gravel mound or terrace currently occupied, as I've said, by the crematorium and before that, Newton House. Construction of McDermott Football Stadium in the 1980s probably removed a significant portion of this mound or terrace. It's one of a series of such natural mounds or terraces along the western edge of Perth, giving the distinct the district its name of Tullock or Hillyland. Although views south and east are now obscured by Perth's urban spread, views north and west remain extensive and give a clue to the attraction of the terrace for human occupation. The construction of the football stadium in the 1980s probably removed the potentially related feature of an undated ring ditch, which could possibly have been a burial ground. For Tullock and the immediate Perth area, we currently know much more about the landscape of power in the later and the, and the earlier First Millennium AD than for the middle centuries. And this is just to give you a sense of that, of that landscape. The key elements of that first millennium AD landscape are shown here. Uh, the earlier first millennium is largely defined archaeologically by the Roman fort we call Bertha at Inveralmond, where the Alan enjoys the Tay, clearly visible from the Tullock Hill. Probably the most significant find associated with the fort is the small altar found on the banks of the River Almond and dedicated to the discipline of the Roman Emperor, a highly favoured cult in the second century. We have hints that the natural amphitheatre of birth may have been the, the locus for other cults and rituals. William Watson interpreted the name Montgrief Hill as a Gillicized version of a British, i.e. a Pictish name, meaning Hill of the Tree. He took this as referring to a conspicuous tree, uh, possibly a tribal tree, that stood there. Watson interpreted Perth's name as a British, again a Pictish survival, comparable to the Old Welsh, Perth, meaning break, brush or cops. He suggested the connection to Perta, also meaning wood or cops, in Gaul, where it was also the name of a grove goddess. In this context, we should note, uh, also note the possible earlier presence of a, a Romano Celtic shrine in what is now the North Inch in Perth, as suggested by uh, what may be a second century uh, Romano Celtic head found there close to the River Tay uh, and its junction with the River Almond. The head, like the altar, is now in the collections of Perth Museum. This may have been associated with a ritual well uh, or series of ritual pits close to the Tay, and we should recall that the obscure name of the Tay could mean the side of or possibly a reference to a river goddess. The political landscape around what became Perth is a little more visible in the 9th to 10th centuries. There are royal estates at school by the late 9th to early 10th century, a place that probably had a royal thanage, an early church, and a place of royal inauguration. And at Fort Tevius, some five miles to the southwest, in Lower Stratford, from at least the 9th century. The Roman fort at Bertha may have been reoccupied in early medieval times as the putative Rathim Baralman, to which there are documentary references in the 9th and 10th, 10th, 10th centuries. The opinion generally favours associating the name with Cranmond on the River Almond joining the fourth. 
Perth itself may have developed as a place of Christian conversion with this cult landscape, but certainly by the 10th and 11th century, it was a focus for the supply of shipborne goods, certainly to Schoon and probably other local states. This later phase is also partly defined by the Goodly Bird Cross. This presently stands within the policies of the Duckling Estate, but originally it was sited in Lethem, uh, less than half a mile from Tulloch, where it may have defined a place of execution and also what came to be called the Borough Muir, where the Borough of Perth staged large fairs. Both may have been in the boundary of the powerful Ruffin Estate. Okay, I want to now turn to the iconographic and ritual context. <coughs> this uh, is a significant new addition to Scotland's corpus of Pictish sculpture. Its single walking figure is not, however, a Pictish symbol. That is, not, that is, it is not part of the formal Pictish symbol system occurring in pairs with a well the mirror and co, as elucidated by uh, uh, Catherine Forsyth, amongst others. Crosses, single animals and monsters are, like the walkers, not symbols, but are certainly symbolic. That, that is important. I propose to treat the Tullock Walker and the other walkers as symbolic within Pictish culture, but not as Pictish symbols. The Tullock Walker is part of a small group of incised, walking, often grotesque, ritually symbolic single figures. <coughs> Namely, Ryan, Seven and Three, Westerton of Balgarvi, Newton of Calesi, Val Blair, and Mail and the slightly wider group of similar figures and figure pairs that form part of a wider sculptural ensemble on cross slabs and panels, namely Gosby, Glans 1 and 2, Rossi Priory, Murphy, Papel, Strathmartin, Lost and Inchbrayer. These have been studied from various comparative perspectives in the context of the discovery of Rhino 3 by Shepherd and Shepherd uh, <coughs> and of uh, Male 1 uh, in Cunningsborough Shepherd. By Turner. The most recent assessment of this loose grouping is that by Kilpatrick around the discussion of the Papa Crosslab. Significantly, Kilpatrick added to our understanding of Pictish cosmography by identifying some of these figures, including the Papal bird headed figures, as mythological warlike creatures. Perhaps, through uh, analogy with contemporary Irish textual evidence, battlefield demons. In essence, her analysis draws on the idea that the repertoire of Pictish art includes an indigenous wellspring of myths and stories, beliefs and practice. As I previously argued, the same wellspring would have also been reflected in performance, dances, dramas, procession, ritual, some of it we can see in the carvings, and some of those carvings were part of the performed rituals. The new addition, uh, Tullock Man, shares traits with all these liminal figures, but most notably Ryanie III, Westerton, Kalesi, and possibly uh, Lair. All five figures have a similar right to left walking gait, uh, <coughs> postures, and as David Henry has observed, uh, Westerton and Tullock are particularly close in this respect. And they also have distinctive hairstyling. Uh, like the carrying of a spear, this may be a distinctive warrior attribute, uh, a, a key signifier of the social class of the warrior, perhaps. The backward combing of hair, sometimes accompanied by colouring and stiffening, is a well-known style of warrior haircut from continental Europe in the first half of the first millennium AD. This is an area that certainly deserves further analysis in the British context, where it lags behind study of Druidic and early Christian tonsures, for example. In the debate around the tonsure and its equivalence to something pagan or Druidic or priestly, it's been shown that the continental early medieval historical accounts uh, evidence the linking of long hair with kingship and its cutting with the loss of royal power. The seeming long hair on the Rhine Seven and male figures helped to reaffirm a king in a specific role. The variant, shorter hairstyle of the spear-carrying ritual walkers may also affirm their role, not as kings, but as ritual supporters of kingship. All the walkers but Westerton, which is damaged, and Bal Blair, where a staff or a club may be being held, carry doorknob-butted spears in their right hands. This gives them a strong flavour of a warrior, 
perhaps in a ritualized role that helped to define the importance of the princely leader or king figure. Excitingly, Tullock Man makes for the clearest depiction of a figure carrying a doorknob, but it's speared. The clarity of the book makes it readily comparable to the Sandy Lane Cemetery in Bedfordshire, England, an example which has been dated to the mid first millennium AD. Of similar date is the mould for making such butts found at the Atlantic Roundhouse at Lockenbury on Lewis. The Westerton figure is too damaged to know whether it carried a second object, but enough survives to suggest it is possibly a naked figure, as Colessi seems to be. In contrast, Rhino III appears to wear a cloak, and like Colessi, carries a shield in his left hand. Both Rhino III and Colessi are also accompanied by the Pictish horseshoe symbol, and Colessi is further accompanied by a rectangular symbol. We cannot know if Westerton once boasted a symbols, but Tullock has no evidence for them. The Balbear figure appears to be wearing a knee length tunic and boots, but whether he wears a helmet or an elaborate hairstyle is undetermined. The object being a carry appears to be too short for a spear, but it may originally have been longer and been worn or damaged. This figure is also at variance with the others in walking left to right. There is a good chance this is not a worry figure, but possibly a figure of different uh, sacral significance, sitting between the warriors and the king, possibly a druid or some kind of magic specialist. The other element possessed by Westerton and Val Blair is their bearing of prehistoric cut markings. Westertons are across its upper edge, whilst Val Blairs are spread across the sculpted face of the stone, helping to confirm their presumed status as prehistoric standing stones. If we allow this to be a genuine reflex about the ancestral past, one that extends to the standing stones without cut marks, then we may be seeing here a sense of that link between the people and the land, which has also been interp uh, interpreted for the symbolism of the Stone of Destiny. It's, cap it's captured well in Isaiah, when, in the context of a hopeful return to Israel, Isaiah says, Listen to me, you who pursue integrity, who seek Yahweh, consider the rock you were hewn from, the quarry from which you were cut. Now, I want to brief, briefly pause for a detour at this point into ancient Persia and then into Vandal Scandinavia. Okay, from the mid-first millennium BC, uh, Persia survives a wealth of imagery, all supporting kingship, depicting king's men, warriors and guards in ritual poses holding weapons, including axes, sometimes presented as gifts from some engaging peoples, uh, and also spears. This slide shows the majority of 51 sheet gold plaques known as the Ox of Treasure. We don't really know what these were for, they're presumed to be votive. Um, but five of the plaques uh, include walking warrior figures who are carrying spears with stylized hair and headgear. Uh, if we look at uh, Scandinavia, we have uh, also some gold plaques which are known as gold cover. Uh, and these are commonly found uh, for the period AD 500 to 800 and uh, uh, are well spread across Scandinavia, particularly uh, in Denmark. Uh, and there's over 3,000 of these known. The five spots suggest they're connected with so called central, uh, 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 often as, uh, central places, often associated with post holes or other structural features. Sites where luxury goods were coming in, where rituals were being formed, performed, and where uh, 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 the leaders of society were based. These examples are from the site at Bornholm in Denmark. <coughs> they combine the lordly or a princely residence of hall, craft production, and trade foci with cult or ritual elements. It's been uh, suggested that the whole assemblage signals a new type of emergent political authority in the 5th and the 6th century, uh, and which has been paralleled uh, uh, at uh, the site of, of Rhine and the excavations that Gordon Lowe has been conducting. So what I'm not trying to say in any shape or form is that either, either the Scandinavian or the Persian imagery has a direct influence uh, on Pictish art. It's simply to show that with certain types of societies, the possibilities of similar ritual actions enforcing authority arise. The Persian and Scandinavian 
case studies provide a, a, a sort of affordance that perhaps give glimpses of Pictish ritual at a time of localised kingship in eastern and northern Scotland. And in recent years we've already had a glimpse of this in the refined understanding of the Pictish axe bearer, uh, and he has uh, connotations with the idea of, uh, of sacred kingship, again, which we can also see operating in Anglo Saxon England and indeed in Imperial Rome. So I would suggest that the symbolic value of the spear carrying walker lies in its cosmological significance, celebrating the status of the warrior and the war band and giving a clue, if you like, to the Pictish pantheon, richly presenting the warrior king to the gods and presencing those gods on earth. Through this relationship, it also served as a protective device on the threshold between the everyday and the reserved sacral space, possibly including funerary and residential elements. And while you're pondering a donation to the uh, 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 trust that I work for, uh, <coughs> I just want to finish by endorsing what Fraser said uh, uh, this morning about serendipity and research frameworks. The Tullock Walker is another fine example. Thank you for listening.